Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the alternative to the alternative media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, Greg Anthony here, and glad you're back on the Investigative Journal on this June 19th, Monday, 2017 day on our calendar. And this month, before I get going, I've been running a pledge drive, and I want to thank some of the people that have donated, and I've sent them emails. And please do that, will you, to keep this show on the air. Uh, Every now and then you run into financial difficulties when you run a show like mine that is listener-based, not able to be supported by advertisers uh, because they don't want to talk about the Vatican-led New World Order and anything that has to do with it. They want to give you a false narrative on what's going on in the world. So if you want to get some of the truth, the hidden truth here, uh, go to my website at arcticbeacon.com and you can get shows go going back over... Uh, 11 years and covering this subject. I first learned about it in the 80s when I worked in Rome as a journalist and uh, continue to trumpet this message because so few people do. Okay, so remember, if you go to arcticbeacon.com, the donation goes directly to me. There's a donate button. If you donate to First Amendment, it goes to the radio station, but the hosts don't get anything. And so, uh, please, if you want listen to my show, go to go to my website at arcticbeacon dot com. Okay, today I want to get back to uh, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I've covered this a long time. I used to uh, talk to Tupper Saucy. He's the uh, the author of the book Rulers of Evil, and he was on my show a number of times. And he passed away in two thousand eight, I believe uh, it was, and. Uh, I used to talk to him on the phone about a lot of different things. Now, here's uh, what uh, they say about his book on Amazon, so let me read this. He says, rather than pass through the Atlanta federal prison camp gate to serve a sentence for tax misdemeanor in 1987, author F. Tupper chose chose to become a fugitive in order to freely investigate his adversary, now, when I talked to Tupper, he'd spent 10 years on the lam. He said he did not want to go into prison because he feared he'd never get out. He was working on a book uh, on who really killed Martin Luther King at the time, and he feared for his life. He was uh, sentenced to a year and a half on bogus tax evasion charges. And it's interesting, he found out that the prosecutor was a Jesuit priest. Interesting. I thought they were uh, supposed to, uh, you know, only be priests. Oh, boy, you don't know anything about the Jesuits. Well, anyway, he wanted to investigate his adversary, the United States government and the Jesuit order, the Vatican. Uh, What what he discovered was valuable new proof of a vast Roman Catholic substratum and hidden agenda of, of American history. More specifically, that Jesuits played an eminent and underappreciated roles in persuading New Englanders to rebel against their mother country in 1776. Indeed, according to Saucy's groundbreaking discoveries, the American Revolution and its resulting constitution, constitutional republic, I might say, may have been single-handedly designed and supervised by a Jesuit named Lorenzo Ricci. This country's true founding father, provocative and utterly compelling, Rulers of Evil analyzes the hundreds of historical clues left behind by the true leaders of the world, what we call here the Vatican-led New World Order, and it should be read by everyone desiring to know definitively why America works the way it does. Okay, I've talked a lot about that portion of history, and you can get that in Tupper Saucy's book. And it's interesting to note that... uh, a lot of the evidence, of course, uh, has been covered up. But there are some uh, very specific, uh, there's one book uh, that I've found that talks about Lorenzo Ricci faking, well, that's what Tupper Saucy contends, he faked his death, came over as the professor and was very instrumental in uh, creating and establishing 
uh, hatred for the colonists uh, against England to create this war, which involved uh, getting France and England at, at odds with each other as well. Now, I've noticed that the, somebody sent me an email about this, and I wanted to look at it. I haven't read the book. It's called The Romantic Depression by Sean McLaren. And the following is an excerpt from uh, his upcoming book. Uh, I'm not sure if it's done yet, but uh, how the dead, the dead light of the black pope and the Jesuit militia have distorted the history of the United States of America. So I thought I'd read this for you. Uh, Sean McLaren, he says, for more than 2,000 years, and I want to do this because it's related to the topic we're talking about, of course, history has been falsely recorded to reflect whatever agenda the powers that be have dictated. An excellent example. The original words and teachings of the half-extraterrestrial, half-human, known to the world as Jesus Christ, were bastardized and condemned to the pages of various Bibles that have served as an effective means of control over billions across the planet. Now, I wonder where this guy's coming from. Now, it's interesting. And I wanted to read that because he's calling, is he calling Jesus a half terrestrial, half human being? This is good. And I want to uh, see how this guy manipulates things. I disagree totally with that statement. Now, let's go. Why not? We have to look at all avenues here, don't we? Now, if you study the history of other countries, he says, you will find the same pattern of lies and deceit and sometimes total inaccuracies. We know this to be true because some brave souls recorded the actual events and handed them down through the generations. And also because we can look at the results of some of those pieces of history, the outcome simply does not match what was written. Boy, he's going to get some Bible believers mad with this, but, you know, it's good to know what's out there. So, where did this, since, now let me explain how I think. I don't believe in extraterrestrials. I don't think uh, there is a space as we know it. I think it's an enclosed area, a very different uh, formation of uh, our planet. Well, I don't even call it a planet. I'm so ingrained, you know, it's ingrained in my head. But I, I'd rather consider it to be perhaps a little flatter than a planet. And uh, I don't think extraterrestrials exist. So that makes his thesis go down the drain. Because if extraterrestrials don't exist, Jesus can't be a half extraterrestrial. Okay. He said that the Bible has served as an effective means of control over billions across the planet. I think it's more or less a, a tool to free yourself from the control of the planet, as he calls it. So we disagree with this. Now, in short, he says people lied in texts and books and newspapers that recorded history for posterity. But why distort a country's historical record? So now he's getting to... What we're talking about here. These are events in the past. How should they affect the future? Why should we in the present care about these distortions? The Jesuits have been the greatest and most prolific ghostwriters and recorders, rewriters of history the world has ever seen. I agree with that. They are responsible for all major works of a man they call Shakespeare. I agree. You know, I've done stories on that. In fact, uh, <coughs> I've done a number of different Oh, I've had some really good researchers come on regarding that and uh, showing how possibly Shakespeare could never have written all that stuff and that it was written by Jesuits, a volume of a standing work that continues to influence and teach us today. All of the great published authors and artists since the mid-1500s have been under the thumb of the Jesuits, including the ones today who have directed their movements, often directing the course of politics and law. For example, through the media, the written word and printed page. The stunning works of Titian reflected history in a new light, along with the majestic portraits of important figures of the day. They were to demonstrate the importance of the painting subjects to members of various courts, which in turn used them to manipulate royals and other social and political leaders. Authors over the past several hundred years wrote many books that influenced social religious, and political movements and actions designed by the Jesuits. Our current history tells us that the most commoners were illiterate, but in fact many were not. 
having been schooled in their homes and in small groups by learned citizens. Many of these groups were held in secret, as the Jesuits outlawed any form of education not preached by their own. He says American history is a running joke. So I agree with a lot of what he's saying. I'm disagreeing with the Jesus extraterrestrial example. But uh, beginning, he says, the joke of American history with the founding fathers, who were mere pawns and syncophants of the Jesuits. Alexander Hamilton was a bastard Rothschild under the firm control of the Jesuits. The others took orders from various Jesuits, including the former black pope, Lorenzo Ricci, who, and I'm going to add this, like Tupper Saucy said, faked, uh, faked his own death in Rome and fled to America. He and his Jesuit priests wrote the narrative in the background. You must wonder how this group of so-called Protestants could not be aware of the strong magnetic influence of Rome. In fact, they did know, but did not speak of it. Some tried in their own way, perhaps attempting to leave us clues about what really happened behind those closed doors of the early Republic. Boy, wouldn't it have been nice to be there and see this going on? And it's, you know, look how people are manipulated today. And I said they're being manipulated today by the use of technology, but back then, see, these, these guys have been doing this manipulation for centuries. They're good at it. Read about the Jesuit uh, uh, reductions in the 15th, uh, late 1500s and 1600s in Paraguay and other, other stories. It's an amazing read. Uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson spoke of bankers, but he really meant the Jesuits who were controlled the families who owned the banks that sought full control over the banking and economic conditions of uh, the United States. Okay, and he also warned future Americans that we should not allow bankers to get a foothold or we would surrender our lives and our land to them. He was really speaking out against the Jesuits, but was afraid to say their name or talk specifically about anyone influencing their society in their society. Remains to be seen whether Jefferson truly was an American patriot, as we call it today, or whether it was always false and controlled opposition, one of many who spoke out against the British crown to deflect attention away from the real purpose of the Jesuits. Now, so we move on here, and we, we kind of compare what he's writing here to Tupper Sassi. A lot is the same. Now, Tupper Sassi was an, a very uh, strong Christian and would not agree to, at all with uh, what the, this gentleman said at the beginning. But we've got to deal with these things, folks. These are the people out there talking about it, and we must listen. Uh, without it, what do we have? We have to understand the minds of other people and work together to work out the differences. My personal belief, based on studying his and other papers, says uh, Sean McLaren, examining circumstantial evidence of the day and studying the results of the actions of the so-called founding fathers, is that these men all knew about them, the Jesuits, knowing, knowingly taking their offices in support of the Jesuits and steered America in whatever direction they were ordered. Not a single founding father ever openly opposed the Jesuits, did they? Uh, well, we have some, you know, I want to add that we, we have uh, John Adams saying a few things, but he never came out openly and said, let's get rid of the Jesuits from the American soil. And it has to be remembered, when the first pilgrims came over here, that was their main concern. And I remember reading a book one time, and they had actual uh, accounts from the first ship that came over and the, and the captain of the first ship, who was very wary of Jesuit infiltration and basically was doing uh, counterintelligence, so to speak, to make sure there were no Jesuits aboard his ship. When the first people came over here, Catholics were outlawed, weren't allowed to hold office. Very few of them, because they knew what they were doing in Europe, how they wanted to take over a country and topple the governments. And they wanted to do the same thing here, and that, to me, folks, is the plan they've had from the beginning. Weasel their way in here under the Constitution, which allows freedom of religion, just the way Muslims are weaseling their way into our country, saying, oh, we're moderates, we're moderates. Ask Fatula Gulen and his, his billion-dollar operation going on in America here in charter schools if he really is a moderate. No, he's not. He's brought over here by William Jefferson Clinton, remains in the Pocono Mountains, funded by the American government, while everybody, Trump, and everybody said, we got to stop terrorism. Well, you start there. 
In fact, Erdogan, president of Turkey, has asked for his removal, from, you know, his extradition from the United States. Somehow that's gotten forgotten about. And uh, really, it is a conspiracy of the highest levels, all of these leaders involved in it. And we are the extras in this big movie, not getting one dime for it and watching it all go down the tubes, so to speak. Now, the, the, he says the Founding Fathers never really openly opposed Rome, but they, they didn't. Quite the opposite. They not only established a prominent central bank in America, they built an entire city to honor Rome and the rulers. We've talked about this so many times on this show. Wouldn't it be great to start a company, you know, a uh, tourist company, where you take people to show them all these uh, signs and symbols of the occult and how Rome is beholden to Babylon and to the occult leaders and to all of this crazy stuff? Oh, it would be great. The only true uh, tour guide. Oh, boy, would you get people mad. What kind of group would we have, though? What kind of people would come? That would be interesting. Uh, wouldn't be your average uh, mom and pop from Kansas, would it? They built an entire city, town of Rome. In fact, Rome, where it's built, Washington, D.C., was called Rome in the old land records in the 1600s. And, in fact, uh, the Potomac was called the Tiber. If you study this hidden history only for a day, only a day, only a minute, I ask you to do. A minute, five minutes, because they all point to the powers in Rome, regardless of what the history books ever tell us now. The Jesuits found the perfect way to divide and conquer the citizens of America by creating a civil war along the lines of the most contentious issue of the day, slavery. What are they doing today? They're creating the same kind of civil war, folks. This is me speaking now. They're doing it the same way, creating this divide between the left and the right, creating the divide between Muslims and Christians, creating a divide between financial, the rich and the poor, creating a divide between the foreign countries and us, um, Korea wanting to lob missiles, China, North Korea, uh, Russia. I mean, it goes on and on. Everything is being divi is divide and conquer for one reason, to bring this country to its knees and down. Because they cannot have a one world order, a one world religion without destroying America. It can't go on this way. Now, slavery back at the time was, says Sean McClare, the biggest money makers of the day. and had been for hundreds of years. And the Jesuits were masters of tearing indigenous people from their homelands and enslaving them in other parts of the world. West Africa was their hunting ground for the America slaves, only a small portion of which were used in the workforce, and that was in the South. The Jesuits controlled the movements and behaviors of the Confederate Army, commanding Jefferson Davis and consulting him the, the plot of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. They even used the most elite Confederate soldiers, then known as Mosby's Rangers, in the escape of John Wilkes Booth. Uh, Davis was a pawn whose job it was was to destroy the Union Army at all costs, but in the end he failed. The Jesuits, however, did not see the Civil War as a failure because they got what they wished for, a divided America. That's what they're doing today, folks. Can't you see it? They're dividing America. And in the ensuing decades, people were taught, after this one hour back to the Civil War, and schooled to identify themselves as either North or South. It goes on still to this day, to view each other as mortal enemies. Jesuit priest ensured now who's viewing the left, views the right, or anybody who likes Trump as a mortal enemy. We have people out there. What's going on? In, there's, there's the theater in the park in uh, New York City. They put on their annual summer theater groups. What are they doing? they got a play called The, uh, the Assassination of Julius Caesar, but they depict Julius Caesar as Trump, dressed in his red tie and his, you know, his uh, white... White hair or silver hair, no, it was uh, gold hair. And it's obviously Trump they're killing. And what about Madonna? I'd like to blow up the White House. And many of these other people talking hatred like this, they're doing the same thing today. Jesuit, so when's the civil, when's the next one starting? That's the question. Okay, all you smart guys out there, and girls, and gals, and women, and men, and everybody, so I don't want to get, you know, Got to be politically correct this day. You know what I mean. I call everybody guys. You know, hey, you know, you ever walk in a group? I don't know. This is maybe I'm still old school. I'll see a bunch of people. Hey, guys, how you doing? And there's a bunch of girls there, too. And, and you know, what's wrong with that? It's just a friendly way of saying hello. Okay. Now, somebody's going to say, well, why don't you say, hey, gals? And the reason you won't say that, Greg, is because that offends men. 
No, I don't know. You know, I really don't know. Uh, why should it offend women anyway today? If you really want to, women want to be like men anyway, don't they? All these liberation, uh, all these uh, liberal women, they, they, they want to be like men. So why don't you just call them guys? All right. I'm going to get a lot of heat on that one, hopefully not. But anyway, America had previously been set up as a system of the United States, which was different, difficult to control as a whole. Following the Civil War, the United States was now sharply cut into two separate pieces both of which were much more manageable by the Jesuits, which set the two against each other and pitched battle, <clears throat> literally. And I think they're going to do the same thing today. They're controlling both sides of the aisle, the left and the right. I did receive a good email regarding, is the uh, shooting on the baseball field of Congressman Scalise a false flag? And go to some of those. Uh, they present some good information, I wonder. It's true, though, back to Sean McLaren, that when you went through a revolution that saw a building of large companies and firms specializing in iron and steel production, the building of great railroads and tall cities, but what that history does not tell us is that those industries were highly controlled and directed by Rome. That's talking about the, Ameri the Industrial Revolution that came after the Civil War, correct? What do we really know? about the history of World War One. Yeah, we do, you know, he's got a point because we do discuss World War Two a lot. We kind of gloss over World War One. There's always something, isn't there? Uh, what was its true purpose? Did it really begin with the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria by a Serbian trigger man in Yugoslavia? Was it actually that simple? Did many countries go to war with each other because of a single shot? That's an interesting question. Of course not. Who would do that? That's all rubbish. What's going to be the next shot over the bow now, folks? Yeah, think about that. What's the shot over the bow going to be this time? They always have something. Of course not back then. That's all Jesuit rubbish. But it certainly makes for a good story. One shot, the whole world goes to war. Let's fast forward to the outcome of the war. The establishment of the world's first single ruling governing body, the League of Nations. Jesuits' goal had been to build a mon... Uh, you know, a single government for the world. They're still doing it. They had hardly sharply, they had already sharply divided all the important countries in the world via some civil war of some series of wars. Yes, during that period of time of the American Revolution and even after that in the 1800s, look at all the civil wars that were, I mean, there was amazingly revolutions all over the place, France, Poland, Germany, on and on. And it was easy to control both sides of the country's political parties when you do something like this. The next step was to unite only the significant and influential countries of the world under one roof. The plan, however, didn't work as ordered and the League of Nations ultimately failed. When something of this magnitude does not work, one must ask how and why. Do you think they'd stop right there, folks? Folks, can answer that question. Did they stop? No! That was just one little stumbling block. Okay, now, how can we do this? What, what do you think the United Nations is? The answer is obvious to those, and back to McLaren, of us who love individual freedom and liberty. The people of the world were opposed to being ruled by the dogs, must like this show, by a single government, as it would mean giving up their own identities, their culture and history, and the very thing that makes them distinct from all others, their own country and all it stands for. The Jesuits, they understood these facts, and still pursued their, boy, they're upset. No, they, they're outside, uh, my neighbor's place, and then when somebody goes by, they get a little, they like to protect it, feel like they're doing something. Now, the Jesuits understood these facts and still pursued their single ruling government. It would take another 20 years, but they did it. Hey, we'll be back in three minutes on the investigative journal. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. 
I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening The following, the following program, program is labeled dangerous, dangerous and off limits by the Supreme, by the Supreme Jesuit, Jesuit Command. command. Yeah, yeah. But stand, stand tall, people. people. Listen, Listen up, 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 and you, you may, may just, just learn, learn something. something. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, this ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This ain't happening. Okay, glad you're back on the Investigative Journal for this second half hour on this Monday, uh, June 19th, 2017, day in our calendar. And before I get back to Sean McLaren's article here regarding a book he has coming out. I wanted to mention, I didn't watch, did anybody watch that Alex Jones interview with Megyn Kelly on NBC? Or did it even appear? I don't have a TV, so I didn't watch. I don't much care about it anymore. I brought it up last week on my show regarding uh, how I believe Alex Jones, you know, I worked on the same radio station as him, was on a show many times. And I think uh, guys that are doing research out there connecting him to being really Faking the death of Bill Hicks, the former comedian, and now turning him into Alex Jones are pretty good. And so uh, check that out if you uh, if you want. I, I'm not really interested in it anymore. It's just amazing to me what they do. And I did see a picture, though, that was floating around the Internet. They had Megyn Kelly in a car with Alex Jones, and they're both staring out the window with their sunglasses on. Happy as hell. So, you know, this is a whole deal. They, they know who exactly Alex Jones is, and he was put there as a plant, and I uh, wouldn't doubt if he's Bill Hicks. A lot of similarities. But anyway, uh, the Jesuits' goal, according to McLaren here, and he's right, uh, they want to build a, 
a single government world. And they had sharply divided all the important uh, countries in the world after World War I uh, and, con- and con- started beginning to infiltrate and control the leaders. And it was easy to control both sides of a country's political parties as they're doing today. And now they control the media as well. The plan did not work as ordered. And the League of Nations failed, like we said. Now the Jesuits understood what happened and it would take another 20 years, but they forced the United Nations upon us, all of us, after another bloody excuse, World War II. Today the UN is used by the Jesuits, and we know that, to remove specific and whole rights within the constitutions of each member nation, and thus the people of those countries now are under the control of the UN. This is a difficult subject to appreciate, but let me, let me add something here, folks. There's something called the, uh, the International Criminal Court, set up by the United Nations. It's controlled by Muslims, and uh, it appears that you can't get justice there for Christians being persecuted, and they're allowing, really, the terrorist groups to function. Wow, what a topsy-turvy world we live in. But today the UN is used by the Jesuits, like uh, he said, to undermine countries. This is a difficult subject to appreciate, let alone accept as gospel, but it's 100% accurate. The U.S. Constitution is a dead letter and, the, and only exists to make us Americans feel we are connected to our founding fathers' ideals of peace, freedom, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. All of it is a grand lie, just like our history, which is being written by Jesuit minions who publish it, it daily via big media and the big entertainment, and we swallow it wholly. Hook line and sinker, even if we attempt to discern between what is true and accurate and what is false. It is sometimes impossible because the inaccuracies are so well dressed up and presented as fact. The ultimate Jesuit intrigue and manipulation and control. Isn't that true though? There's so much out there. You don't know. It's so hard to decipher and that's what people fall into. So it's really, I believe in active faith and I believe, uh, you know, that you, you know, if you follow the word of God, you'll, 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 you're liable to get through all of this stuff. So anyway, uh, what I wanted to do for the remainder of the hour, I've talked long enough, haven't I? Is uh, there's a guy, uh, he has a Norwegian or a German accent. He's called Joggler66. And he went through the painstaking study of reading the whole Tupper Saucy book online. Yes. So I'm going to go to the conclusion, chapter 12, Lorenzo Ricci's War, and pick up where he is reading. And it's nice to hear a different accent. Here we go. Louis XV, being an absolute monarch, parliamentary resolutions were worthless without his signature. Louis, being obedient to his Jesuits, was highly unlikely that he would ever sign a resolution condemning the Jesuits. Yet, sign it he did. And why he did has remained a point of debate. Some say his mistress, Madame de Pompadour, craved vengeance against court Jesuits for implacably denying her a mass. Others say the king needed Parliament's favour to bail him out of debt. I submit that's Tupper Saucy. I submit that Louis signed because Lorenzo Ricci wanted him to. That means that he even wanted him the Jesuits to get banned out of France because he has an agenda that he has not told you yet. When the resolution became law, Ritchie released the French Jesuits from their vows. The society as an institution ceased to exist on French soil. Louis consented to allow the Jesuits to remain in France, but as regular clergy. Others went into exile. Père de Valette, whose financial problems had brought to him uh, on, on the bagel, was exiled by Ritchie to live the rest of his life as a private citizen in England. When the war that had begun in the Ohio Valley reached Martinique, the English occupied the tiny island and took over the Jesuit plantations, selling them, slaves and all, for more than enough money to have paid off Lavalette's debts. In the midst of their decomposing glory, the Jesuits received from Clement XIII an awesome gift designed to make welcome the most humiliating of circumstances. This was the mass and office of the Sacred Heart, with its icon of a realistically blood, bloody heart plucked from Christ's ribcage and ignited by an eternal flame. Based on 
visions resulting from the spiritual exercises made by St. Margaret Marie Alacoque <clears throat> between 1647 and 1690, as promoted by her Jesuit spiritual director Claude de la Colombière, Sacred Heart is a Gnostic Jesuit production centering on the Savior's perfect humanity. Quote, by devotion to my heart, unquote, Jesus, uh, Jesus supposedly revealed to Alacoque, quote, Tepid souls shall grow fervent, and fervent sh souls shall quickly mount to a high perfection, unquote. Sacred Heart summons true believers to pay a debt of, quote, unquote, reparation for the world's sins. The debt is payable only by prayers, penances, masses, and, significantly for this epoch in the society's history, social action. John Carroll, so indispensable for the outworking of the American Revolution, was profoundly devoted to Sacred Heart. Louis XV was the effective head of the family compact, an agreement between reigning Burm monarchs to present a united front before the rest of the world, quote-unquote, on important measures. Once he had dissolved the Jesuits in France, he advised other Bourbons to do likewise, although he could not name anything to be gained politically, economically, or financially by the society's dissolution. The issue, quote, still remains puzzling and problematic, unquote. Professor Martin says, unless considered, I submit, Tapasosi, in light of Sun Tzu's rules. At any rate, the Bourbons, the Bourbon Charles III of Spain followed Louis' advisory. Charles convened a special commission to prepare a master plan for ousting the Jesuits. No one could produce any hard evidence against the society, but there were plenty of rumors. A mob that had risen up to protest the law Charles had passed forbidding the wearing of white sombreros was said to have been fomented by Jesuits. A rumor swept across Spain that the Jesuits were nursing a plot to assassinate Charles. The Jesuits supposedly had proof that the king was technically a bastard and should be deposed. None of these rumors were ever substantiated. Moreover, General Ritchie ordered the Jesuits to do nothing to dispel them. The result was that 46 of the 60 Spanish bishops decided that Spain should follow the Marquis de Pombal and oust the society. And so the commission drafted an expulsion order, which Charles signed on February 27, 1767. The order was executed by ambush, reminiscent of Philip IV's move against the Knights Templar in 1312. Charles sent out sealed envelopes marked, quote, not to be opened before sunrise of April the 2nd on pain of death, unquote, to all provincial viceroys and military commanders. When sunrise came and the recipients opened their envelopes, they discovered two letters inside. The first ordered them to place troops around the Jesuit residences and colleges during the night of April the 2nd to arrest all Jesuits and to arrange for them to be placed aboard waiting ships at certain docks. Quote, if a single Jesuit, concluded the king, even though sick or dying, is still to be found in the area under your command after the embarkation, prepare yourself to face summary execution, unquote. The second letter was a copy of King Charles' original order of expulsion, which began, quote, being swayed by just and legitimate reasons, which shall remain sealed within my royal breast forever, unquote. And went on to say that, quote, all members of the Society of Jesus are to leave my kingdom, Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and the other formerly independent kingdoms that made up Spain, and all their goods are declared forfeit by virtue of the highest power which the Lord Almighty has confided into my hands. Unquote. The king made sure to discourage any investigation into causes. Quote, it is not for subjects 
I just wanted to say I can't get through this whole chapter today. But go and, uh, you know, if you don't like reading the book, sometimes people like to have it read to them. And this is a good way to do it. Look up uh, Joggler 66. You can find it easily. Tupper Saucy, he reads Tupper Saucy's Rulers of Evil. And I like to bring in little parts of it every now and then just to maybe stimulate your enthusiasm to uh, go to this book. So let's continue with it. To question the wisdom or to seek to interpret the decisions of their sovereign, unquote. <laughs> now, isn't that interesting? At that time, at least politicians told the people, my decisions are not worth of discussing for you. There surely was not a democracy or a republic or whatever. The king could do as he wanted to do. And if he said, I make decisions that I do not want the people to discuss about or whatever, because they are too dumb anyway, he just said it is not for subjects to question the wisdom or to seek to interpret the decisions of their sovereign. The sovereign is untouchable. That's always the same. Look at the Pope today. It's the same thing. He is the judge of all men, yet he cannot be judged by man. I just want to insert this. I have to get that rid of my, uh, I have to get it off my chest. You know, this Peter and that starting um, not only the investigation, but also the persecution of the Pope because of the pedophile agenda the Roman Catholic Church has, and he wants to bring all these parts to the to the to the clergy to the court. I always said he can do that as much as he wants. Under canon law, the Pope is untouchable, and because all these courts are obeying canon law, you can never touch him. You cannot question the sovereign. In this case, here uh, in the book, it's about the King of Spain, and in the other case, it's the King of the World. And let me add something. He's bringing up Kevin Annette and that uh, law of common courts he started. And, you know, I used to, I've had Kevin and Ned in the years past on my show many, many times. And uh, he was the uh, priest in Canada, not a priest, he was uh, an Anglican uh, priest, I guess, or he was a Protestant there in Canada somewhere, and he was being persecuted for uh, helping the indigenous people. But, boy, there's something strange about that guy, and I kind of disconnected with him. And that's how you learn sometimes. You've got to talk to these people. And some I know I'll get criticism at the beginning of the show for putting that little statement on that Jesus was an extraterrestrial. I didn't say it, <laughs> but other people do. And uh, you got to deal with these subjects. How do you think I learned about all a lot of the perpetrators? It's actually by firsthand knowledge, by dealing with the hard issues that we may not agree with. And I'll tell you, that Kevin and that's a, a, a dude to watch. I don't trust him, basically. Here we go. The Antichrist, the Pope, sitting in Rome. He cannot be judged by men, and never will be. God will judge him. He is the righteous one to judge him. Let that over to him. But for us, the very important work to expose him and that's what I applaud Kevin Annett for, that he does that. Absolutely, I applaud him to that, because he makes people aware of the pedophile problem within the Roman Catholic Church. He will not have the success that he wants to have, but that's because the things are the way they are. But at least he makes people attend of the fact of the global Vatican pandemic pedophile agenda that's all over the world. Okay, I just had to insert that here. So, you know, it's not only reading, I also give my opinion. You can agree or you can disagree. I really do not care very much, but uh, we're looking forward to your comments on this maybe later on in the video. Okay, I'll continue reading now. Only days before April the 2nd, the Spanish ambassador to the Holy See presented a document from Charles to Pope Clement XIII that explained, quote, Your Holiness knows as well as anyone else that a sovereign's first duty is to ensure the peace of his dominions 
and the tranquility of his subjects. In the fulfillment of this sovereign task, I have found it necessary to expel all the Jesuits residing in my kingdoms and to commit them directly to your holiness's wise stewardship in the states of the church. I beg your holiness to consider that my decision is unalterable and has been made as a result of mature reflection and all due consideration for the consequences. Unquote. Clement, the likelihood uh, of whose submission to the will of Lorenzo Ricci should not be underestimated, responded in a melodramatic vein, as though playing for an audience. Quote, of all the shocks I have had to endure in the nine unhappy years of my pontificate, this one, of which your majesty has informed me, is the worst. Unquote. The Pope had little more to say, except that the king may have placed himself in danger of eternal damnation. The order was executed during the night of April 2nd and 3rd. Some 6,000 Jesuits were rounded up throughout Spain. They were crammed into the lower decks of 22 warships. In May 1767, the gruesome fleet appeared off uh, Civita... Oh my, that, that, that's a different Civita... Civita de Vecchia. <laughs> Civita Vecchia, the port of the Papal States, and amazingly was fired upon by shore at artillery. The ships were denied permission to land their human cargo by order of the Pope himself, pursuant to a conference with Lorenzo Ricci. Historians are at loss to explain why Clement, so devoted to the Jesuits, would impose such cruelty upon his beloved and their hour of need. The most plausible answer I would suggest, suggest is that his understanding was obedient to the inscrutable command of his general, whose exceedingly private objective, after all, was to disqualify the Society of Jesus and the Roman Catholic Church as viable enemies of Protestantism, at least in the North American colonies. No longer enemies, they could develop personal alliances. The suffering priests, the guns of Civita Vecchia, were all explained in Amiot's son too. Quote, Your army, accustomed to not knowing your plans, will be equally unaware uh, of the peril which threatens it. A good general takes advantage of everything, but he can only do that because he has operated in the greatest secrecy, because he knows how to... Okay, I wanted to break in and say that, you know, in order to get shows like this all the time, you're going to have to uh, go to my website at arctizbeacon.com, hit the donate button, and help the show along. That's the only way it's going to continue. And uh, I've been going through some times uh, debating whether I should continue this show, and it's going to depend on, is there enough listeners? I've been doing this for well over 11 years, and uh, I'm waiting... Uh, I'm going to give it a little bit of time and also thinking of starting my own little blog to function, to fund this show and uh, perhaps reach out to listeners that don't go here because they're afraid to turn on a Christian station and they really don't know what the, you know, boy, I'll tell you, it's, uh, you know, that's the way Americans think. They say, Christian, I, I can't go there. They're All they're going to do is slam me with all this Jesus stuff. So far from the truth. Come to this show and listen. You might just learn something, people. So go to arctizbeacon.com and don't be afraid to push that donate button. Here we go. Remain cool headed and because of the government with uprightness. At the same time, however, his men are constantly misled by what they see and hear. He manages for his troops never to know what they must do, nor what the orders, nor what orders they must receive. If his own people are unaware of his plans, how can the enemy discover them? Unquote. Over the next few months, thousands more Jesuits were expelled from the remaining Bourbon states of Naples, Parma, Malta, and Spanish America. 
Jesuits in French America, Quebec, and New England were left undisturbed, as were those in Austria. In October 1768, the Austrian Empress Maria Theresa at Habsburg wrote her Jesuit confessor, confessor Father Koffler, quote, My dear father, there is no cause for concern. As long as I am alive, you have nothing to fear, unquote. But Maria Theresa hoped to marry her two daughters to Bourbon princes, Caroline to the son of the Spanish king, Marie Antoinette to the son of Louis XV. Bourbon ambassadors. I've got to say this right now. Now, this very valuable video that this man is presenting, and he reads it to you as if, you know, put it, you know, listen to it while you, when you're going to sleep. I like people reading books to me. But let, let me tell you something. Something strange going on here. There's 958 views. Then I look across at a video. Now, <laughs> people, I'm telling you, this is what we're dealing with. Here's the title of the video. The extraterrestrial that walked among us. True story. He spoke over a hundred languages. You know how many video? They got 674,199 views. Just to tell you what people are thinking. Incredible, isn't it? Rulers of Evil, chapter 13 and 14, 8. 191 views. Very sad. Very, 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 very sad. And uh, go to this guy. I'm going to, uh, what do we got? About 50 seconds. So I just wanted to spur your interest on to go to Tupper Saucy's book. I was lucky to have a chance to talk to him before he passed away, and he was a great guest. And I think only one of my three shows remain. Many were destroyed by the powers that be when I was at these bigger radio stations. Two of them were, I know, that I never was able to get back. And that's how they operate. But they cannot destroy your soul. They cannot destroy who you really are and your relationship with God. That's one thing. They want to do, but they can't do it. And that's why you got to remain strong, people. And that's why you got to come back to this show. And that's why you got to donate at www.arcticbeacon.com. See you tomorrow on the Investigative Journal. The Book of Revelation says... The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today. So you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The prophecy. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it. Nations have fought for it. It has been traded. It has been borrowed. It has been purchased. It has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.